This series on women in science, technology, and business is brought to you by Zoho Corporation. Zoho is the operating system for business. Hello, I'm Kamla. My guest today is Leila Takayama. She is a social scientist, teacher, and an author. She is a human-computer interaction and a human-robot interactions researcher. We'll find out more about it. And she teaches at the University of Santa Cruz uh, in the balmy Santa Cruz area. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> what was the weather like in Santa Cruz today? Uh, it's foggy in the morning in the summers, but then it's gorgeous uh, in the afternoons. Do you have a name for the fog there? Um, no, it's not called Carl. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I don't have a name for it. I'm sure someone does. <laughs> okay. So what is this human-computer interaction and human-robot interaction research? Throw some light on that. What does sure. that mean? What do you do? <laughs> it's a mouthful. <laughs> um, I think of it as this intersection of a bunch of disciplines. So it's really, you know, psychology, computer science, even neuroscience. Um, depending on the domain, it might even be something like medicine, right, or physiology or anything, right? It's just a bunch of people from different disciplines coming together to try to make technology better for humans, <laughs> um, more useful, more usable, um, less intimidating, um, so that you know we don't just make things so that we can make them. We make them for people with a purpose. So I understand the human-computer uh, interaction because computers have been around with us now for a very long time. Yeah. But robots are new for many of us. Yes, they are, and they're way behind computers. Yes. Uh, so. so what what do you do in that area? Yeah, so, um, you know, I sort of like to compare it to back in the day when computers were really big, scary mainframes in big buildings, and only computer whispers <laughs> could program them. A very select few could handle them. Right now, that's where robotics is. Um, robots are big, they're scary, they're not that reliable, and only the robot whispers can wrangle them. And really, we want to get them to the Robot place. whisperers can wrangle them? Yes, yes, they can, but the rest of us can't. You, sound, um, you make it sound so esoteric. <laughs> well, you know, programmers who know how to deal with the real world and physics. Uh, and it's not easy, right? And I think really the, the challenge is to make robotics useful um, for everybody, not just for the robot whisperers. And that's the same thing we did with personal computers. That's right. I remember when I first started using computers, uh, I would lose my files. Mm -hmm. I would go up to my teacher and say, the computer ate my homework. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they did, right? Files would just disappear. Yes, it was yes. a Unix machine yes. and they would just disappear. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it wouldn't, and you, you, the print command, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I would never know which print I had printed in. Yes, yes, and robots are just the same. <laughs> right. So, so it's a communication problem then. Mm -hmm. That is, we have to, robots cannot, can they operate by themselves or do they have to be fed instructions? Um, they need to be fed instructions right now. There's a lot of people who are working on the space of machine learning right. where they want robots to learn things over time. But again, that takes training from people. <laughs> so, you know, there's always humans in the loop there. How, when did you first see a robot? Um, the first time was right after I graduated from grad school, and uh, I visited this place called Willow Garage because I wanted to in buy In Menlo a robot. Park? Yes, Menlo Park on Willow Road. Okay. Um, and uh, I walked in the front door and was walking down the hallway with the guy who would eventually become my boss. Why and, were you there? Um, I, was, I wanted to buy a robot. Um, but you had never seen a robot. I won't well, actually I had but <laughs> I didn't know that till later um, Yeah, we wanted one for the lab right to do research with and this one actually wasn't fully baked yet They weren't ready to sell it, but they're like actually we could use some help designing it hmm. um, So this ugly metal thing that was about 500 pounds came rolling up to us um, It was you know, it was huge and hulking looked like a big gorilla. Kinda. What was it called? Uh, the PR2 personal robot 2 it was based on the PR1, which was done at Stanford by Ken Salisbury's group there. Okay. Oh, so this was, did the, the, did the founder of Willow Garage have any connections with Stanford? Yes. Uh, he had gone to grad school at Stanford and was very well connected in that community. And Ken had this pretty cool robot that was actually made of wood. <laughs> oh. The gears were even made of wood. Um, and they decided they wanted to do it for real. So they brought a bunch of students over and started working on PR2 at Willow Garage. So PR2 ran away from you. Yeah, it spun its head around and ran away and didn't come back. And I thought that was kind of rude. I felt like I'd been blown off. <laughs> um, and so you were not intimidated by the robot? I was a little intimidated, but when I checked the two people next to me who were walking, they were like, 
it's okay. Right, they didn't run away screaming, so I figured maybe I shouldn't run away screaming. <laughs> so then you ended up joining Willow Garage. I did, yeah. I'm and what did you to, do there? I tried to make it a little less scary and a little more polite. How? Um, we would, you know, run studies to figure out, you know, how should we design it. So, for example, um, the first robot had so many cameras on its head. Uh, it looked like a gorilla on wheels with a tarantula head with, like, literally maybe 12 eyes or more. Um, that was not okay. This was designed to be a personal robot in people's homes, maybe, uh, and it just couldn't look like that. And so we actually played with different forms of the head and where to put the sensors so that people knew where to look, right? Like, how do you make eye contact with a thing that's got 12 eyes? And so we emphasized two of the cameras and played down the rest, right? So they're still there, but at least it gave me a focal point to look at so I don't get totally freaked out the first time I see it. So as humans, is it important for us to make eye contact with a robot? It's important for us to have, a, I think, a way of predicting what it's going to do. Why? Um, because robots, we shouldn't have that expectation from a robot, right? Well, we are scared of things when we don't know what they're about to do, right? Uh, so with a car, it doesn't have to have a face, but they kind of do have faces, right? Cars, yeah, you know they're... where the front is. You know which way they move. They've got two headlights, right? Um, I don't think that's an accident. Um, that's by design. It makes it feel more familiar than it really is. Um, and we've had to make up a language for communicating with things like cars. Similarly, we're making up languages right now for how to make sense of other kinds of robots. Hmm. So this was about uh, eight years ago when you joined uh, uh, yeah. Willow Garage. Right. And then from there, you moved uh, to Google. Yes. And then from Google, you moved to Santa Cruz, mm -hmm. okay? So, and, and between, I guess you've done other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. you started a little consulting company. Uh, how, when you were growing up in uh, Palo Alto, because you came here as a young kid, mm -hmm. what did you think you would become? <laughs> um, I was, I w didn't want to do what everyone else was doing. Why? Uh, because I wasn't, it didn't, it felt like it would just be following the pack, right? To, Oh, there's a dot com. Of course, we're going to go do a startup, right? Oh, look, there's social media. Let's go do a social media thing. And I've just never really wanted to go along with that. And so I've always tried to find a different angle for approaching, you know, similar interesting issues that other people care about. But I just didn't want to go and do what everybody else did. <laughs> so you had a mind of your own, even yeah. as a kid, because you grew up, you were born in Hawaii. Yeah but you didn't go to the school that President Obama went, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Why? Oh, boy. Okay, so... Uh, Spill the beans. Yeah. <laughs> well, when I was uh, four years old, you know, you, you know everything, of course, and uh, I had to interview for kindergarten. <laughs> so, you know, two of the, the really good schools in Honolulu are Punahou and Iolani. Um, and I interviewed, and the testing was fine, but then they want to make sure that, like, you're an okay kid. So I went into the interview, and I don't remember this at all, but... My mom tells me that I told the Punahou people that their playground sucked. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't get admitted to Punahou. And I went to Ilani. I guess I didn't insult their playground. Um, yeah. <laughs> but do you remember the playground at Ilani? Um, I do. It was actually really nice. And that was apparently very important to me. <laughs> okay. So you, so, so the, the, the point being, you knew your mind, even as a kid. Yeah, I had opinions. You had opinions. Mm -hmm. And so you didn't want to follow the pack. Right. But were you good in math and science? Yeah, I did math and science. I did all the APs, all that stuff. But you're a social uh, researcher now. <laughs> yeah, I turned away from it. Why? Um, probably lots of reasons. Uh, one of them was, you know, the Palo Alto Unified School District is very good at math and science. Um, and so everybody did it. Uh, and I wasn't sure that that was what, like, do we really need everyone, everyone to do math and science? Um, I actually hated the social sciences when I was in high school and didn't, discover until college that there is so many fascinating things about humans that there were left to study. Um, mm. So I, I switched over to more the social sciences in college. But was there a teacher that uh, was mm -hmm. not uh, very flattering of your math capabilities? Yes. Uh, yeah, my uh, BC Calc teacher in high school um, was pretty discouraging. Um, there was a time I was, I was a teenager. <laughs> I'm going to preface forgiven. it with that. I was You're under forgiven. 18. Um, I dyed my hair purple, um, just streaks of purple. And I think he sort of decided, that, like, I'm not so sure about her anymore. Uh, and he told my chemistry teacher this, who then told me, like, hey, 
yeah, you, you might want to, you know, maybe dye it back black. And I couldn't, it was bleached. I couldn't make it black again. So um, the hair color made a difference. I guess so. Okay. Uh, which is weird because I was still the same kid doing the same math homework. Um, and so, you know, he sort of gave up on me. Um, and that, you know, it made me kind of angry. And so I decided, like, I'm going to try even harder and show him I can do it, like, regardless of what happens in the class. Um, so I took that AP exam, got a five out of five, and then was like, I don't want to do math again. That wasn't fun. Like, I did that to prove him wrong, and it felt bad. Like, that's not a good reason for doing math. Um, what kind of a teacher are you? <laughs> oh, jeez. I don't know. I'm, I'm learning, I guess, what kind of a teacher I am. Because you had this experience with the math teacher. Oh, Ooh. yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> right. sometimes... I don't do that to my kids. Yeah. You know, teachers don't... Uh, sometimes, maybe they don't understand the power they have over young students. Yeah. Because we look up to our teachers. Right for endorsement and for, you know, if you're not doing well to give us feedback. That's why I'm asking. How yeah. has that shaped your attitude now that you're a teacher? I don't think you dreamt of being a teacher. Mm -mm. It wasn't in the game plan. <laughs> it wasn't the game plan. <laughs> but now it's <laughs> now front it is. and That's center. That's what I'm doing, yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, how do you find yourself being a teacher? Because you're teaching, what, in Santa Cruz there are 200 students, I, yeah. I guess, in a class. Right. So right. that's a huge class. They're very big classes. Yeah. Um, I try to be as available as I can. Um, I also, I don't want to give up on them, right? Even if they feel like if they're ready to give up, I just, I don't want them to. Right? Where did you get that uh, desire not to give up? Did you have good mentors and teachers? Yeah, I had some amazing uh, mentors. So, I mean, the, the, the one who is probably the most influential in my life was Cliff Nass. Um, he was my PhD advisor at Stanford. At Stanford. And what was uh, Dr. Nass's uh, forte? Oh, God. Well, he did magic professionally. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was just a kind, caring, brilliant human being. Um, and the way that he mentored us was really like being a dad. Uh, I think, I mean, there were no boundaries really between like the ways that he treated, you know, professional uh, people that he worked with and people who were family. Like everyone was welcome and everyone was warmly welcomed at all times. So it's very accessible. Very, yeah. So he was not greedy about guarding his time. No, he, he should have been more careful about guarding his time. <laughs> okay, and he helped yeah. you. If you got stuck, he helped you. Absolutely, okay. yeah. He would drop whatever he was doing to help us. Where did you develop this intense, because for, because you've had a very interesting uh, path to becoming a teacher, it's right? Crooked, yeah. <laughs> well, crooked is, uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. it's a journey of self-discovery. Yeah. You know, curiosity seems to be at the center of it. Yeah. It's because I'm thinking you were good in math and science and then you got turned off and you went to Berkeley. You mm -hmm. ran away from Palo Alto to Berkeley, yes. the other side, <laughs> and you did cognitive science, yes. which is an amalgamation of different subjects. And mm -hmm. from what little I know, it's how your brain functions mm -hmm. or how you make decisions, right? Yeah. That's one of the, your psychology is part of it. Right, understanding the mind. Yeah. yeah. So what drew you to study cognitive science? Did you know anything about cognitive oh, science? I'd never heard of it when I went to college, <laughs> until I got to college, actually. Um, I, I mean, I went to Berkeley because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I knew that any department there would be strong. And so whatever path I picked, it'd be a good one, right? Was that okay with your parents that you didn't know what you wanted to be? They were, yeah, they were pretty supportive of that. Okay. Um, so I was lucky. <laughs> I mean, my mom was a teacher too. She gets it. Oh, your mom is um, a teacher? Mm-hmm, yeah. What does she teach? She, she used to teach special ed when we lived in Honolulu. Um, and then she moved over more towards research um, when we moved to Palo Alto. And she studied what, psychology? Yeah, she was developmental psychology. So you followed her footsteps? I went cognitive psychology, which is totally different. It doesn't matter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you, can split, you can split hair, but at yeah, the end of the day, psychology. the psychology. <laughs> okay, so you didn't yeah. know what was cognitive science? No, I didn't. Um, it, it, and actually, a lot of people would be like, what, is, what are you going to do with a degree in cognitive science? Right? Um, that question I got a lot. Um, mm. And my students today actually get that question a lot, so now I can arm them with answers. <laughs> How do you arm them? Um, it, well, it depends on what they're going to do. So a lot of them say, you know, well, um, I don't know if I want to go to industry or academia. I don't know if I want to do lots of stats or math. I don't know if I want to do programming or design. And really, cognitive science is this, like, wonderful community of people where you could go any of those directions and be ready for it. You've got the right methods. You've got the right tools. So you can 
can you just go the liberal arts uh, route, you or, do you need, or, or do you need math and stats to do cognitive science? It, it helps to do math and stats because you can appreciate those perspectives on trying to understand what the mind is and how it works. But you could also go pure philosophy if you wanted to, right? And be, you need to be a very articulate <laughs> person who is comfortable living in theory, right? And all those people work together on the same questions, which is pretty cool. So how did you decide that you wanted to major in cognitive science? I mean, I, I really, I guess the way that I make decisions is I just try things and I see how they fit. And I had taken a bunch of classes that happened to be in that major and loved them all. Uh, so I figured, well, I might as well get a degree in that, right? Because um, this is stuff that I would do even if I didn't have to. So curiosity again, yeah. because, <laughs> because this was a widespread of subjects. Yes. Uh, and you went looking. Why are you curious? What does it do to you when you're curious? Is, do you look for answers? Does it excite you? Does it make you happy? Yeah, there's a, I like trying to find answers for questions that don't have answers yet. Were you a pesky kid? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I was a handful. <laughs> no, what does your mom say? You know, did you always say why this doesn't work or? Yeah, I asked a lot of questions. Um, I challenged a lot of things that I was taught. Um, I think I was kind of annoying as a kid, probably. That's okay, but, <laughs> but the curiosity is something that you have nurtured. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, and, and you haven't given up on it. No, that's, all, that's what I do now. So who are some teachers at Berkeley that helped you to your next stage because you finished cognitive science? Did mm -hmm. you know what you were going to do next? No, no idea. <laughs> um, so you had no game plan? No. I somebody just, went to Gunn High School? I know, I know. And from Palo Alto? Right, yes. <laughs> that is amazing. It's different. Mm -hmm. That is, no, the reason I yeah. said that's amazing is it's an organic way of uh, figuring out, you know, instead of being straight jacketed into saying you want to do science or engineer. Yeah, it's a little more bottom up. Yeah, so, yeah. so, and that gave you a lot of flexibility and room to breathe mm -hmm. and discover yourself. So, so then what did you do after you finished your undergrad? Um, so while I was an undergrad, I started doing research um, as an undergraduate research assistant, and that completely changed everything for me. Um, I hadn't planned on going to grad school um, until I started doing research and realized if you go to grad school, you get to pick the research question you work on. That's kind of cool. Um, and so I did some research in both the psych department and the CS department, computer science department. And the computer science stuff was super fun uh, because we were prototyping things that had never existed before. Like? We're getting, um, we were working on um, using what was called smart dust. Mm. These were tiny, tiny little sensors. And, you know, as sometimes happens in engineering, they're like, we made this really cool thing. What are we going to do with it? Uh, and so my job There's was, no use case for it. <laughs> Not yet. So, you know, you bring in people who can help you with that. Um, know your limits. And um, they're like, well, we need to find applications. And there were some folks who had been digging around, you know, with, you know, maybe, maybe we'll use it for figuring out when the bridge is going to collapse or when the building is having issues. Um, and some other folks like, well, what about firefighters, right? Like, that was actually a friend of mine did a class project with firefighters. And it turns out it would really help if they knew more about what was going on on a scene when mm. things are burning. And they're like, you're not putting anyone's life in danger by throwing a bunch of sensors in there, right? And actually you can make the firefighters work safer mm. if they have more awareness of what's going on in the space, so. Because the sensors are sending back data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and you can make more informed decisions, right? About like, are you gonna send people into the second story of the building? Is it safe, right? Mm. Um, are there victims in there? That'd be good to know before you send a bunch of people in or not. So, you, so, so the census found a use case. Yeah, so well, we helped it find a use case. <laughs> um, so I actually got to spend a bunch of time literally sitting around in fire stations and learning about how firefighters do what they do mm. in order to find applications for these sensors mm. and then prototyping interfaces for them to actually use them. And I remember they would always tell us, like, if you make it, we can break it, which was a challenge. <laughs> so they're a really interesting group of people that we just really wanted to help Hmm. do their jobs better and safer. So there you're doing cognitive science, but you're tinkering in the computer science totally. lab. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which is so much fun. And so <laughs> then, uh, so this, this, this problem happened. So I was in my third year at Berkeley and I'd actually finished all my classes. And I didn't know this until I got told, you know, if you finish your classes, you're done. You're getting kicked out of the university. <laughs> you're gonna have to graduate. And I was like, but I still have research to do. I'm not done doing research. Um, so I declared psychology too. So I was like, I'm gonna, I, have, I have a second major. You can't kick me out. <laughs> and so I, I declared psych also. Um, and I had taken a bunch of classes there anyway because I love them. 
Um, and so that managed to like give me the full four years um, to keep doing research in computer science and also do more, you know, studies in psych. So is that where you got this human computer interaction? Absolutely. Yeah, I caught the bug. There. there. Uh, and that was, so James Landay was the professor there in computer science who, you know, had my back and believed in me and um, even like funded some of my research in the summers so that I could continue working with them. So that must have meant a big deal to you. That was huge. Um, that was, yeah. That because was. a professor backed you and covered, you know, you had yeah. your back. Right. Where other teachers didn't. Right in the mm. past. So why did it, did you ever ask him why he? I, <laughs> I I never did. I should ask him. Because I would be curious to know why. What what did he see in you that yeah. he thought that he should have your back covered I... and fund some of your research? Right. Yeah, I don't know. Because sometimes teachers see in their students that you, I mean, right. you may not see. Right. You know. Yeah. Maybe maybe he saw something. So then uh, you finished Berkeley, mm -hmm. and then which grad school did you go to? Oh, uh, right. So, uh, <laughs> I, I came home. I swore I would never go to Stanford because <laughs> I was from Palo Alto. I also swore I would never work at Google because everyone went to Google and then I went to Google. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, when I was applying to grad schools, um, you know, a lot of people say, like, you want to go to the best school. But really, for grad school, what matters more is your mentor because mm. you're basically becoming another version of them. Um, and I met a bunch of professors and I remember meeting Cliff. And thinking it'd be so cool to be even like you know half the researcher that he was, right? And and a good person at the same time. Um, and so, even though I didn't want to go to Stanford, I didn't want to be a traitor. Um, I went to Stanford because Cliff was there, and he was great um, as an advisor and a mentor. Carnegie Mellon you know, is the place to go. Carnegie Mellon is the place to go. Uh, I did visit there for Admit Weekend, um, and I didn't have the same chemistry. Um, that I felt when I was at Stanford. I didn't quite see how I would fit in. Um, whereas it was just blatantly obvious when I went to Stanford. Um, everyone told me like, of course you're gonna go to Carnegie Mellon, right? Like that's the obvious choice. Um, of course you're gonna go to MIT, right? And I visited there too. And it, it just, it didn't feel right in my gut. Um, and Cliff was amazing. So it was really just about like getting to work with him. And you majored, uh, your PhD was in communications. Yes, which is weird too. <laughs> yeah, because I'm thinking, <laughs> yeah. you know, you're, 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 yeah. doing, you're tinkering in computer lab. Why right. communications? Um, well, so every grad program I applied to was a different department. Um, Carnegie Mellon was computer science. Uh, Georgia Tech was engineering psychology. Uh, MIT was actually architecture. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, UC San Diego was cognitive science. So that would have made sense. But Cliff happened to be in a com communication department, so I went there. And he was actually a sociologist. He wasn't trained in communication either. So, you know, we all have, <laughs> we wave different flags, but we do the same research. <laughs> what did you do your research on? Um, I was, gosh, we did a lot of things. We did uh, studies looking at how people interact with semi-autonomous cars. We did studies looking at how people sort of build and feel about the robots that they make. Um, we did studies with mobile phones and context to work computing. It was all over the place. It Imagine. was really just trying a lot of stuff. So it was technology because yes. the time you went to do your PhD a few mm -hmm. years ago was when all these things were coming to a head. Absolutely. Yeah, right? and it's Silicon Valley, right? Yes. So there's a lot of questions, open questions, that are actually really well answered by social science, um, and that's what our lab did. I want to ask you because one of the things that you do is data-driven decisions for robotic products. Mm -hmm. That's what you focus on. Yeah. And yet, when you make decisions in your personal life, it's yeah. by a toss of a coin. Basically, yeah, literally. Why? <laughs> um, I think, you know, when it comes to figuring out what you want to do with your life, there's just too many variables. I have made the long pros and cons list for all of the big decisions in my life, and usually when I make the rational decision, it's wrong. Uh, and when I've made the gut decision, like meeting Cliff and just knowing that that was like what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be, it was right. Um, and so I've just learned the hard way <laughs> that when I try to over-rationalize life decisions, it's better to go with my gut. But who taught you that gut uh, decision making? That was, that was James Landay. Um, so when it came to deciding about grad school, he told me, okay, get it down to two schools, flip a coin, and that's the school you're gonna go to. And now see what your gut feels like. Do you feel relief or do you feel anxiety? Um, and if you feel anxiety and fear, just go to the other school. And uh, I've used that many times since then, and it's worked. 
Um, and so that's actually the advice that I give to students now when they're trying to make a decision. Third or fork in the road, right? Like at some point you're gonna get tired of your pros and cons list. You don't even know how to weight those pros and cons. Um, you gotta trust your gut, which is actually, you know, a, a fuzzy way of calculating like what's right for you. And you're taking all those factors into account. It's just more implicit and less. Have rational. you ever gone wrong with any of your gut decisions? So far, no. I have gone wrong with my rational decisions. You have. Yeah. <laughs> uh, picking picking the wrong job. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and yet you're teaching robots to be rational. Well, robots are already, they're already rational. <laughs> Maybe a little too rational, right? Um, I think when you're making a product decision or you're designing something for someone else, there you got to be a lot more calculated about like, are you actually helping them? Are you meeting your design goals? Um, are we are we making a positive difference for those people? And that's different from making a decision about you. You know you better than anyone else, but those users probably know themselves better than you do. If someone wants to work in this industry that you're working on as a social researcher yeah. uh, and work with robotics, what skills or what classes should they be taking? Oh boy. Um, well, <laughs> research methods is critical. Um, stats. Stats, but also, you know, how to do a good interview, mm. right? How do you ask questions in a way that don't lead the witness? You don't ask people, do you like my product? Do you like this cool thing that I just built? Right, that's gonna get you answers that how, how would you phrase that question? Um, you would say, so, you know, we have this thing right here and these other options, what do you think? Right, you don't put your ego into it. Uh, you don't invest yourself in it. And you also tell them things like, hey, do you wanna try using this, this app? Um, you know, there's no way you can do it wrong. We just wanna see what people do when it's in their hands. I'm not judging you, I'm judging this product. And if you can't use it, it's the product's fault and we're gonna fix it. Um, having that approach and that attitude can make all the difference um, in terms of figuring out which direction you should go when designing these tech products. Do you need to have computer science classes? You can, it can help. It's a perspective. Um, and I think it's a useful tool in your tool belt to have, but there's a lot of useful tools that you should have in your tool belt to work on tech. So thank you so much for stopping by and talking to us. No problem. Thank you for having me. Not at all. And thank you for tuning in. And if you missed any of our shows, you can watch them on our YouTube channel or on our website, kamalashow.com. We'll be back again next week with another edition of our show. Until then, goodbye. This series on women in science, technology, and business is brought to you by Zoho Corporation. Zoho is the operating system for business.